Point Grey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the Minister has been uh, in the media and in this place uh, defending the inaction of this government around uh, the inflows of uh, international speculative capital into our residential housing market that's making housing unaffordable. And uh, unfortunately, during question period, we don't really get a chance to go through in detail uh, exactly uh, why it is that uh, we continue to ask the government to take action. And, I'd like to take the opportunity to go through a few of the reasons why. Um, I'm going to start off with a, an open proposal made by 28 economists from the Vancouver School of Economics. These are professors at UBC. Two uh, SFU professors in urban economics and 15, 15 Sauter School of Business economists who, who say that they think we should be taxing the international money coming into our housing market. They say that doing so could, quote, provide significant benefits to lower mainland communities, uh, that their proposal is a feasible and economically meaningful response to the rising tide of global financial flows into BC residential real estate. And there's the Conference Board of Canada's report released yesterday or today, the days blurred together. Quote, it seems clear to us that outflows of wealth from China have at least some influence on the greater Vancouver housing market. In previous re research on this issue, Standard tests find significant correlations between China's real GDP growth and three important market yardsticks, namely existing home sales, existing home price growth, and total housing starts. By contrast, local employment growth is significantly correlated to none of these, and the five-year mortgage rate related only to resale variables. This could mean that a substantial portion of greater Vancouver real estate purchasers do not need local jobs to buy a home, and that many do not need a mortgage to buy a new home, the broad statistical conclusions we reached in 2013 remain valid. And then they say, this leads to the question about what can be done. And they offer two potential solutions. One is to, uh, to place restrictions on non-residents' ability to buy homes. At the same time, housing supply could be boosted. So you'll note that the Conference Board of Canada doesn't say do nothing. They say there are a couple of options available, uh, both of which they seem to be suggesting should be approached. Then CIBC. Quote, there is a clear sense of urgency among many Chinese residents to send money out of the country, given the risk of a large-scale devaluation of the, of the yuan. But the main focus of the real estate agents, these are international agents that focus on Vancouver, was on QDII2, the Qualified Domestic Individual Investors II pilot program that allows individuals with net financial assets of at least 1 million yuan to invest up to 50% of those assets in foreign markets. They talk about how, uh, with the 20% depreciation of the loonie relative to the uh, Chinese currency, Toronto and Vancouver look very attractive. Accordingly, the consensus among these international real estate agents was that the next few years will see even more foreign money entering Canadian real estate markets. And then the, the CIBC deputy chief economist says, while we wait for better data, quote, we can start dealing with the speculative aspect of foreign investment through regulation and taxation. Royal Bank of Canada. Chief Economist, Craig Wright, whenever you get to these high values in housing, you're vulnerable to shock. The shock one worries about most in housing is interest rates to some degree and employment. And that's under the headline, Housing in Vancouver, Toronto, quote, dangerously unaffordable, unquote, says Royal Bank of Canada. Business in Vancouver, Jock Finlayson, Vice President, Chief Policy Officer for the Business Council of BC, quote, how do you grow a global scale economy in Metro Vancouver if your employees, particularly your employees in the age where they start families, can't afford to live here. Looking ahead, I am fearful of a hollowing out of corporate Vancouver. Vancouver has the highest income equality. Quote, that has to do with the structure of employment. There's a segment of the population that are very affluent, many of whom aren't even working, and that's obviously driving up housing costs. This disequilibrium between median household income and the cost of living particularly the cost of housing, is the single biggest problem we have in the region. That's Jock Finlayson from Business Council BC. How's this being covered in, in the business press? Canadian Business Magazine headline, How Vancouver's Runaway Real Estate Became a National Problem. Quote, what is unique about Vancouver's real estate bubble is the unwillingness of authorities to do anything about it. Governments in Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom are all trying to slow the rush of international capital into housing markets. 
The remarkable thing about all the reporting and analysis of the Vancouver housing market is its consistency. Everyone comments on how authorities such as CMHC are only now starting to gather data on the extent to which international buyers are responsible for price escalation, an inexcusable example of bureaucratic inertia and old-fashioned Canadian complacency. Writers and commentators present entirely logical arguments for why a tax or regulation aimed at leveling the playing field between regular home buyers and the world's ultra-rich would be an entirely reasonable response to what is clearly an unusual situation. So everyone from academics, a group of 45 economists from both leading schools, universities in British Columbia, two bank economists, deputy chief, chief economist, the, the, the business press, the lead economists for the Business Council of BC, all calling, not for collecting data and doing nothing, but for government involvement in this file. And they, they're open, as am I. If the minister brings a proposal forward, I'd be glad to have a look at it, to different approaches to dealing with this problem, but not one of them saying do nothing. So can the minister please explain why his answer is let's watch and see what happens instead of actually taking action on this problem? Minister. Uh, thanks, Honourable Chair, and to the, uh, the member. He is uh, certainly correct about uh, one thing. Uh, this is a uh, far uh, better form than uh, question period necessarily is to have an exchange of ideas and uh, perhaps canvas the, uh, the approaches that uh, he would advocate or, uh, or that the uh, government uh, would advocate and intends to, uh, to follow. I'll uh, take advantage of his uh, question then to uh, offer some thoughts. I, I guess I must begin by uh, observing uh, that I, I disagree pointedly and uh, profoundly with the uh, observation or the assertion that the, uh, the government uh, is or, or has done uh, nothing. Now, uh, the member may disagree with what the government has done. The member may uh, believe that it uh, will not have uh, an effect or the effect uh, that he uh, is seeking. I'm hoping during the course of the, uh, the exchange uh, I will uh, be able to discern in clearer terms uh, what it is, uh, the effect, what, what effect the, the member uh, is seeking uh, by virtue of uh, government intervention uh, into the marketplace. And, and I don't say that to be mischievous or meddlesome because I think it's a, a fundamentally important question. Uh, what is it uh, that uh, the member believes should be uh, the objective of further government intervention uh, into this matter? Is it to uh, drive the cost of homes down from where they are today, which is clearly uh, elevated, uh, clearly heightened from what it was um, uh, a month, a year, uh, three years ago? Uh, is that the objective? Is it to, uh, is it halt, to halt uh, the uh, the rise in uh, in housing costs, uh, I, I think that too is uh, an area that it is legitimate to uh, explore in terms of the conversation we're going to have. But to suggest that nothing has been done in the face, for example, of uh, the single largest change in property taxation policy that is now in effect and flowed uh, immediately from the, uh, the budget is I, uh, is I think inaccurate. Uh, and, and that's the, I guess the kindest term uh, I would use. I mentioned uh, in the, uh, the brief exchange we had the other day in question period that as a result of that change, uh, about 25 families, individuals per day, uh, now uh, uh, buy a new home for which they don't pay property transfer tax. That, transaction has immediately become uh, more affordable uh, to the tune of upwards of, of $13,000 depending on uh, where that uh, that home is priced. Um, we can track uh, this and, and do obviously through the returns that are, are provided. It's over uh, 2,200 uh, families uh, that have benefited from that, uh, from that single change. We are also able to track uh, the numbers of families who uh, have entered the market in the last four months as first-time home buyers. Um, how are we able to do that? Because, of course, 
on the property taxation uh, documentation in order to qualify for the exemption, uh, they self-identify. Uh, 50 families per day. 50 families per day are entering uh, the housing market uh, in British Columbia. Uh, this number applies to uh, across uh, British Columbia. Over 7,000 uh, families, individuals, uh, purchasing a home for the first time uh, in the last, uh, uh, between January and May. Uh, so the, uh, the assertion that it is impossible for uh, people and families to, to enter uh, the housing market uh, flies in the face of the hard data uh, that we actually uh, have in that, in that respect. We have other uh, data that is of assistance in considering some of the ideas uh, that have been advanced. And if I have at some point uh, uh, conveyed uh, anything other than interest in those ideas, then I regret that because every idea is worthy of, of consideration. I confess to having uh, views of my own. Uh, some of that is informed by data that uh, perhaps others uh, do not examine or, or haven't studied. So for example, when we talk about the notion of a speculation tax, or some people call it a, a flipping tax, you gotta be careful how you say that, I guess. It's, it's more than one flipping tax. Um, um, but I think uh, members know uh, what I'm referring to, speculation tax or, or tax on, on flipping real estate. Um, we, actually, we actually have sound data on the number of transactions that that would apply to because we are able to track through, again, the property transfer tax uh, return exercise uh, when a property, uh, when a transfer in ownership takes place within a year or within two years. And we're able to estimate uh, on that uh, basis. So as people have uh, advanced these, uh, these ideas, uh, what, I have, uh, what I have suggested is that we be uh, clear on the, uh, on the objective. In the case of the speculation uh, tax, at any of the rates that have been suggested, the, uh, the amounts involved uh, would be very modest. Uh, very modest in, indeed. Um, the, uh, and I, I also gather from the ideas in the form that they have been presented that this additional tax would be imposed on, uh, on folks who uh, uh, are transferred, whose, whose employment changes and they are forced to relocate uh, within uh, uh, the stipulated period. Uh, who, because their family circumstances change, uh, are forced uh, to relocate. Uh, these are people who would find themselves captured by a new instrument of taxation uh, because of how it has been defined and how it would be applied. Now, the alternative is to create exemptions, and that is very possible. But for each exemption that is created, the number of transactions that would be captured by the measure shrinks even further. And Again, what I have not heard in the course of uh, uh, the discussion that has taken place is uh, the intended consequence of a taxation instrument like that because the suggestion that it would, it, it seems clear from the evidence in the jurisdictions where it has been tried that it does nothing to reduce the cost of housing, nothing. And if that is the objective, uh, then perhaps it bears emphasizing uh, that the experience in those jurisdictions runs counter to what uh, people are purporting to be the objective here. Uh, the member has uh, referenced in his uh, initial remarks uh, some of the, uh, the studies. He, uh, ironically, uh, in the, the most recent one, the uh, conference board report for uh, uh, for the uh, Vancouver Board of Trade, Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, went to precisely the same uh, uh, page that I did and the, uh, the quotation around uh, the, the questions of uh, uh, what are to be, uh, what is to be uh, done. And there is another recurring theme in all of these, uh, in all of these studies. The, uh, the CIBC uh, report, and these are, I think, thoughtful individuals um, who are presenting uh, their analysis of, of the issue, their analysis of the, uh, 
the market. The author, uh, Mr. Tall of the, the CIBC report, I must say, um, in in uh, in his report, I was intrigued by the uh, the methodology. Uh, he said, in order to get a better understanding of the market, I attended a dinner with over 20 real estate brokers and agents uh, who deal exclusively with foreign buyers. Uh, I asked many questions, and after a few bottles of wine, I got some answers. It's, I'm not criticizing the methodology. I might want to participate in it. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, honourable chair, um, but he does make the point that. Um, he says flipping is on the basis of his dinner and conversation, he concludes that flipping is not the main motivation. Um, he again acknowledges, and this is a theme that, that is consistent in, in virtually all of the, the reports and papers and, and suggestions. Uh, he says we do not have all of the information we need and we have to accelerate the process uh, of collecting that information. Uh, he, he does, in fairness, offer the suggestion that the member re referred to about uh, even though flipping is not the main motivation, uh, he is drawn to the, uh, the notion of a, a, a tax on, uh, on foreigners who uh, uh, invest and later uh, sell, and, and he is certainly entitled uh, to that view. What I have uh, tried to uh, to offer, and where I think the member does, it would be fair for him to suggest he encounters um, hesitancy on my part, it is to take a step of this order of importance in the absence of some firm data. Because the anecdotal uh, information uh, runs the gambit in terms of the influence, uh, the influence that foreign capital uh, is having uh, and foreign investment. Uh, to what degree uh, is that foreign investment actually investment by uh, Canadian citizens, permanent residents? Uh, so I do think it is legitimate uh, before uh, taking the step, uh, taking a step of that magnitude uh, to be able to point to some data that says here, we are acting on the strength uh, of this factual information which points out that X percentage of the market, X percentage of the, uh, the purchases uh, are uh, uh, deriving from this source or this uh, in, these, uh, in these circumstances. Uh, I, I, think that is, I think that is a responsible uh, position to take. It is not to diminish in any way uh, the challenge that uh, uh, that exists, particularly uh, in and around uh, Vancouver, in terms of uh, uh, the opportunity uh, people have to access uh, housing, I think today is a good example. Uh, we see, see a good example of the two dimensions to this issue because we got the report from the conference board for the Board of Trade, and another report that I suspect the, the member will uh, get around to mentioning from the uh, Centre for, for Policy Alternatives, which speaks to another dimension of the housing uh, issue. Uh, we talk about uh, affordability of housing and then there's the question of affordable housing, uh, which tends to involve, uh, in many instances, those in the, uh, the lower income uh, streams having the opportunity to access uh, housing, co-op housing and rental housing. Uh, and that presents uh, yet another uh, uh, series of uh, series of challenges. There does, on balance, honourable chair, and then I'll, I'll let the member have at me uh, again. There does seem to be two broad schools of thought uh, about how to deal with this. Uh, one says, uh, in the uh, in the tension that clearly exists right now and is playing out uh, in the way that we see in terms of elevating uh, 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 property and housing uh, prices it is to take steps that would reduce demand. Uh, and some jurisdictions have done that. Uh, that's one, uh, one approach. Uh, the other, uh, which uh, the, the member will know I have uh, tended to favour, is for us collectively to take steps that would increase the, the supply and provide a, a broader range of options 
to those wishing to get into the, uh, the housing market. Now ultimately, in a complex market, the answer, uh, may, uh, the answer may be a combination of the two. But in taking that step, uh, I think it behooves us to at least be in a position uh, in defending that step, or that hybrid approach of uh, taxation and supply, to be able to say we made that decision on the basis of, of hard uh, data, and as the member knows, uh, we are now in the process of, uh, in a concerted way, collecting that data. I'll stop there and let him continue. Member. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, here's, here's what I'll, I mean, the Minister said a lot in 15 minutes. I, here, here's what uh, I think the two schools of thought are. One is there's a problem. One is everything's fine. And I think I know where the Minister falls. Despite his various objections, I think I'd overcome the objections about you know, if you tax the money that's coming into our real estate market, that's coming from people who are not paying their worldwide tax in British Columbia, if you tax that money, either, either it's a problem or it isn't. So if you, if you tax it, and there's no, there's no issue there, you don't generate any rev revenue from it, you don't affect the housing market, there's no consequence, it just sits there, it's a useless tax. But if you do put the tax in place and there is international speculation in our housing market, if there is money coming into our housing market from people who don't pay their worldwide tax here, and it is a problem, and you generate revenue from the tax that you can put into affordable housing initiatives. I'm trying to find the downside of the proposal put forward by the 45 professors of economics, the 45 PhDs in economics, that, that brought this proposal forward. I'm trying to find the downside of why the minister will not act because it has the, the dual effect of gathering without debate the data about how many people are buying real estate in the lower mainland but are not paying their worldwide tax in British Columbia. And I think that's really the key point. It's not, are you a permanent resident? Are you a citizen? Are you from here? Are you from there? Are you, is your family originally from, who cares, right? Are you paying your worldwide tax in British Columbia? If you are, have at it. If you're not, you've got to contribute. You've got to pitch in. And so, you know, I think the, the core issue here is whether or not the minister recognizes that there's a problem. And let me, let me point to a study on it. It, it is unfortunately dated because um, it's based on 2011 census data. But two, uh, 25,000 households, according to Statistics Canada, 25,000 households in Vancouver paying, uh, paying more on housing than they have an in income. That's 10% uh, that's of the households. And let me give you an example of a few of the neighborhoods we've got here. Dissemination area 59150581, Arbutus Ridge between Arbutus and McDonald Streets, the median dwelling value, $1.98 million. The median income from all sources declared for tax purposes, $19,000. I don't want to understate it. $19,993. Average house price, $2 million. Average income for tax purposes, $20,000. South Granville, average dwelling value, $1.8 million. Average income for tax purposes in British Columbia, $13,572. Coal Harbor area around the, the Fairmont Pacific Rim. 62% of households say they have lower income than their shelter costs, but the, the average income in that area is, uh, is $14,293. The median is just $943 a year for the people who own properties there. Now, the minister might stand up and say, oh, there's a lot of retirees, maybe they don't, they're living on their savings. In, in Greater Toronto, the, the rate of people declaring lower income than their shelter costs is 5.9%. Montreal, it's 5%. Victoria, it's 5.4%. In, in Vancouver, it's 10%. So it's double. So we've got a lot of people buying really expensive property that aren't paying worldwide tax in British Columbia. And I think this is maybe the core of the concern. And that is certainly the core of what the proposal that came forward from those 45 economic professors deals with. It doesn't matter, citizenship, permanent resident, whatever, are you pitching in? 
So the question of the minister, has he studied this phenomenon? Does he have better stats than I do about income declared by British Columbians, worldwide income, declared on their income tax forms, as compared to the value of the property that they're purchasing and that they own in British Columbia? And can he share additional information beyond the dated information uh, that's available through the 2011 uh, census data? Minister of Finance. Uh, thanks, Honourable Chair, to the, uh, uh, to the member. Uh, well, the, the member asked a, a, a specific question uh, about, uh, about data, uh, and I should say this, I'll say it on the record, he anticipated that I, uh, correctly that I would. Um, yes, there is a, a phenomenon in a market uh, like Vancouver. It has long been the, the case where uh, there are individuals who are, are asset rich and uh, uh, income, uh, income much poorer, fixed income uh, seniors uh, being a classic example of that. We are um, an older uh, society in British Columbia, not the oldest, the Maritimes are uh, uh, demographically older than, uh, than us, uh, but we are a, uh, an older society, so that is a, a phenomenon uh, with which we are not, uh, we are not uh, unfamiliar. Uh, the member seems intent, uh, Honourable Chair, on wanting to characterize uh, this as a case of uh, a government and or a minister uh, who doesn't believe there is an issue and doesn't believe there is a, uh, a problem and a challenge. That is categorically not the case. I clearly understand uh, that uh, in a particular part of British Columbia uh, there is an issue. When you see the proportion of uh, listings uh, to sales, um, it is clear uh, that uh, that is presenting upward pressure uh, and uh, uh, causing, causing issues. Um, but the data that the member does not have and that I do not have uh, at the moment is that which entitles us to say uh, the market uh, is being influenced uh, to this degree, uh, to, to X degree, by the engagement, uh, by the, uh, 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 the influx of uh, true uh, foreign capital and foreign purchases and speculative uh, foreign purchases. Uh, we got, ironically, uh, see if I can uh, dig it out uh, for the member. Uh, not from the uh, Vancouver, uh, not from Vancouver, but from uh, the Victoria uh, Real Estate Board, and, and I think the member would agree the the pressure that we see in uh, in Vancouver is having a ripple effect uh, elsewhere. It certainly seems to be the indication uh, here in uh, in Victoria. Uh, the Victoria Real Estate Board does apparently track uh, the origin of buyers. I'm told it is a, a self-reporting. Uh, mechanism, uh, so it doesn't account for 100% of transactions, but uh, of those where there is a, a self-report, uh, 1,700 transactions in Greater Victoria in the first quarter of the year, 1,700. Um, and the Victoria Real Estate Board uh, reported uh, that the vast majority of Victoria buyers are from within the local Victoria marketplace, 73% uh, uh, from Victoria compared to uh, 70.5% last year, 8% uh, from the Lower Mainland compared to 7.5% last year, 4% um, from Alberta, oddly enough down 5.5% uh, from uh, last year and 1% uh, uh, from uh, the US which is roughly comparable to, to last year. So 
Um, those, those numbers, to the degree that they are, uh, that they are accurate, would lead one to suggest that um, uh, the market in uh, Victoria and the capital region, at least, is not being uh, influenced by the, uh, the phenomenon of uh, uh, vast sums of uh, true foreign uh, capital uh, investment uh, in the marketplace. So uh, it is not a case of uh, wanting to uh, ignore or deny uh, that there are issues that accrue from rapidly escalating property values. Uh, the reports that the, the member has referred to, uh, by the way, some of them at least, and certainly the one for the conference board, uh, go to great lengths to, to point out uh, that this is a, a symptom of a very strong economy, uh, of a whole range of other advantages uh, that have developed uh, here in British Columbia and on the West Coast that are attracting people uh, to our jurisdiction. Uh, those are, uh, doesn't diminish the importance uh, of the challenge or our need uh, to respond to it. It does, I would suggest, uh, make it incumbent upon us uh, to take steps that do not put in jeopardy uh, the value that uh, British Columbians have accrued in the most important asset most people will ever uh, own, and to do so in a way uh, that does not put at risk uh, the enviable record of economic growth that we have uh, uh, established for ourselves uh, leading the country, in fact, uh, in, that, uh, in that respect. So uh, uh, there are some, uh, some additional uh, thoughts for the, uh, uh, for the member. I, I should say, finally, uh, the, uh, uh, the, there are a series of ideas. The, the member has referred to one that involves uh, the imposition of an added tax on every property, uh, every property in the jurisdiction that would be covered, uh, and then an application process for exemptions uh, based on certain criteria. Uh, the, the member is an advocate uh, of, of that approach, uh, of, of, that, uh, of that approach to uh, utilizing uh, uh, that instrument of taxation, of increasing everyone's taxes and then asking them to apply on the basis of a set of uh, certain criteria uh, for an exemption from that tax uh, increase. Um, I'm not sure uh, that is uh, the best uh, approach to take with respect to uh, uh, affordability, uh, but uh, the member is clearly quite taken with the, uh, the approach. Member for Vancouver, Pond Gui. Mr. Chair, and I'm going to leave the ridiculous political suggestion aside that we would be collecting uh, additional taxes from every British Columbian and then refunding them through the income. That is the most inefficient, ridiculous implementation of the private member's bill we've put forward that I could possibly imagine. And it is comments like that, and it is the attitude of this minister towards a serious issue that prevents us from making progress on it. I want to hear that minister, Mr. Chair, stand up and tell British Columbians on the record whether he thinks it's a problem that people who are not paying their worldwide taxes in British Columbia are buying property. And here's why I want to ask that question, Mr. Chair, is because the people who work hard, pay their taxes here to support the social systems that make this place a wonderful place to live, are wondering why they can't afford to buy property on the wages they earn. And there is a very reasonable belief backed up by Conference Board of Canada, CIBC, 45 economics professors, that it is flows of capital from people who are not paying their worldwide tax in British Columbia that are driving this housing market, at least in part. So will the minister stand up and say, yes, I agree that this is a problem, that people who are not paying their worldwide tax in BC are buying money in the situation of a deflated loonie, are buying, mon are buying housing in the situation of a deflated loonie, with money that's earned in a jurisdiction where they don't have to pay the same level of taxes, and competing with people who are paying their taxes, building the schools, building the parks, building the communities that make it an enviable place to live. Does he think that's a problem? Does he think they should have to pitch in like everybody else? Minister. Uh, thanks, uh, Honourable Chair. Uh, I think that for uh, decades, uh, for decades, uh, governments of various political stripes uh, 
with varying degrees of success, I might add, uh, have sought out uh, people and encouraged them to come uh, to this province and to this country uh, and make investments. In a broad range of economic endeavors, uh, including in the real estate sector. That is not uh, a policy, an approach uh, to economics that is unique uh, to this government uh, or government of any political stripe. And the member in response to a, uh, a circumstance that has uh, arisen that is of concern, it is of concern particularly in one part of British Columbia, is suggesting that uh, the government should adopt a significant change in policy relating to how we tax uh, those who come uh, to British Columbia and make investments. And there may well be merit, but he seems, he seems genuinely offended, Honourable Chair, that I would respond to that by saying, before we take that step, let us clearly understand the degree to which that is influencing market behavior. And, and uh, there is nothing I can say uh, that apparently is going to change his mind that that represents a responsible uh, approach to this. Um, he, I, I say this not to be argumentative, but for him this conversation apparently revolves exclusively around taxation policy and the question of curtailing uh, demand, in this case international uh, demand, uh, and far less concerned, far less concerned than I am about other steps we can take to increase and significantly increase the supply of housing that would be available to domestic purchasers. And uh, to the extent that uh, that is a piece of this puzzle, or a piece of this equation uh, that the member uh, does not believe is important, uh, then he and I uh, will simply disagree on that point. Member. Mr. Chair, where, where is the supply that the minister is talking about? Where is the initiative to create affordable housing in Metro Vancouver? Where is that housing that I can tell people that are making the decision, young people, about whether or not to stay in Metro Vancouver and invest their time and energy instead of moving somewhere else? Where is it? Where is that initiative? I'd love to hear the minister's suggestion about workforce housing. I'd love to hear the ways he's going to build additional uh, rental housing for people who are out working uh, in middle, middle uh, uh, Greater Vancouver. I'd love to hear that. I haven't heard word one. So um, to, to be scolded for failing to support supply from the same minister, Mr. Chair, that brings forward not a single initiative to build affordable housing. He says that pro by providing uh, relief for first-time homebuyers from the property transfer tax, he's somehow helping the situation uh, for those families. They are in bidding wars with 10 or 15 other families for housing. So if he wants to increase supply, wonderful news. Tell me um, how he is doing that. But, but just as importantly, uh, Mr. Chair, is, is this question of the, the difference between investment, constructive, productive investment in building multiple family housing, or in business, or in mining, or in forestry, or in agriculture, or in manufacturing in British Columbia, and investing, or rent seeking, as the term that economists use, where you park your money in residential housing. And if this minister is standing up and saying that he's encouraging international investors, quote unquote investors, speculators, to park their money in the number one luxury real estate market in the world, which is Vancouver, by the way, more than uh, Sydney, more than Hong Kong, more than London or Manhattan, well then I think he should say that on the record. Is he encouraging international speculators to park their money in Greater Vancouver Metro housing. He should be really clear about that. And then we can draw a very clear line as opposed to smearing everything together and saying, oh, you're opposed to investment in business, you're opposed to investment in construction. No, no, we're talking about existing residential housing. Is he encouraging international speculators to park their money in housing? Minister. Uh, thanks, Honorable Chair. Uh, I have, uh, I don't think, uh, in the course of these uh, discussions over the years uh, with the member and others, 
uh, endeavored to put uh, words in the member's mouth or in the, uh, the mouths of his, uh, his colleagues, I'll uh, ask that he uh, extend the same courtesy to me. He, uh, he has said, uh, uh, Honourable Chair, that he, is, he would be supportive of efforts to address the, uh, the supply of, uh, of housing. I, I will take that as a minor victory in these uh, proceedings. He then says and signals again, ah, but I see no evidence of that. He chooses apparently uh, purposefully, uh, Honourable Chair, to ignore the single largest investment in social and affordable housing contained within the budget, $355 million. $355 million. Now, for, for the member, for the member to, to say it's not enough, I want more, I think there should be more, I accept that. I accept that form of, uh, of criticism. But to dismiss as inconsequential and to describe as empty, hollow and non-existent the largest investment ever, uh, I think is disingenuous on a magnificent scale, uh, Honourable Chair. To dismiss as inconsequential uh, a step uh, that is designed to encourage, encourage the construction of more homes, uh, not by providing funding to the developers themselves or the builders, but to the people who purchase those homes, uh, to the tune of $13,000, uh, up to $13,000, and to dismiss that, uh, well, I've already said the member and I disagree. What more can we do? Uh, Honourable Chair, I believe, and am endeavouring to, uh, to, to verify this, that in the metro region of, Brit metro Vancouver region of British Columbia, there are proposals for thousands of new housing units. Thousands. And they languish in planning departments awaiting approval. And there is important work to be done by planning departments. I understand that. But Madam Speaker, when that work takes three, four or five years, it delays, it delays the availability, the construction and availability of those homes to those who would want to purchase them and are able to purchase them. I wonder, I don't have this information, I, I wonder what the impact would be at a time when there are uh, only 2,000 housing units on the market. I wonder what the impact would be if in the span of uh, a number of months we could double or triple that. The, the private sector uh, wishes to build them. The proposals are there. We can augment that uh, at the social and, uh, and uh, uh, affordable housing day with, uh, uh, with housing, uh, with social and supportive housing. Uh, we have already made a sizable commitment uh, on that front. Uh, but, but Madam Speaker, I didn't enter into this discussion uh, wanting to, to poke anyone in the eye. I think there is a, a difference of opinion. I regret, uh, I regret that the, uh, the member continues to feel uh, uh, that uh, there is uh, inaction. It may not be uh, the approach that he, uh, uh, he is most comfortable with. I regret that he doesn't, he doesn't want the government to wait to verify empirically uh, what the impact of this investment uh, is on the marketplace. I mean, I, I disagree with that approach, but I, I understand it. I, I understand that's, uh, that's the approach. Uh, and, I understand, uh, and I understand this. Uh, I understand that um, he represents a, a part of uh, British Columbia where this uh, problem has reve revealed itself most acutely. And I respect that. Uh, I respect that. The, uh, uh, the, the landscape, the housing landscape of Vancouver is changing. I think that is, that is true. I think there is, uh, there is trauma associated with that. I think there is a role for government uh, through that transition. 
Uh, I accept all of that. But, uh, uh, Madam Speaker, I regret that the, uh, the, the member uh, uh, believes that, uh, continues to uh, believe that uh, I do not see this as uh, important or, or urgent. Uh, most assuredly, I do. Member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I, I have a regret too, which is that we're out of time because there are so many things that the Minister said that deserve response. I just wanted to read into the record uh, some questions uh, that were passed on to me by community members uh, that the Minister uh, is, uh, is welcome to respond to in writing. Uh, how, in your opinion, does our housing market experience differ from Sydney, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Auckland, where these governments find it prudent to restrict international speculation in their housing market, but we don't? How do you expect to att attract tech jobs when young people can't afford to live near their work? What incentives, tax or other otherwise, will the Minister put in place to encourage housing developments, including rental, that are actually affordable to Metro Vancouver's workforce? Based on record personal debt levels and negative discretionary income for young people, what percentage of mortgage holders in BC would be in financial distress if interest rates decreased 1%? What share of GDP growth in BC is directly attributable to residential real estate? What report stats has the government commissioned on the impact of high real estate prices on non-real estate local businesses in the CRD and Metro Vancouver areas? On the Minister's new forms, is he requiring disclosure of citizenship residency of all directors of companies that buy real estate in BC? What share of the benefit of the property transfer tax cut does the Minister actually believe goes to buyers versus sellers in a market with limited supply and very significant international demand? How is the Minister working with CRA to identify tax evaders in relation to the real estate market? How many reports to CRA? How many requests to CRA for information? So I thank the Minister's uh, staff very much for, uh, for all their assistance uh, to him during this process. And I uh, pass the minister on to my colleague, who I understand is waiting in the little house for him.